Right, so what I'm going to do now is to try and get KDE Plasma installed, um, but this involves quite a number of stages. We've got to get X Windows up and running, um, probably install some extra tools, and there's quite a bit of configuration to do. And generally, what I'll do with getting any sort of GUI going is to get X Windows installed and get it tested with a very simple window manager called TWM um, that basically proves that the graphical side of um, X Windows is functional and then I move on to the actual um, desktop environment itself which as I say will be KDE Plasma and that itself is um, two distinct parts there's the K, KDE frameworks and then there's the actual plasma. So the KDE frameworks is like the structure of KDE, if you like, um, which includes um, some apps, I believe, off the top of my head. And there's, then there's plasma, which is the actual desktop environment that utilizes a lot of the uh, KDE frameworks. So that's the plan. Um, just one thing to mention, if you remember when I booted this for the first time, I was getting a message saying, something to do with um cannot read or write location outside of partition um just before the grub menu appeared i have had a quick look on the internet and it seems it could be a problem um between grub and the xfs file system uh, there has been a bug in the past with an earlier version of grub so i'm suspecting it's something to do with that still um it is the first time i've installed Gen 2 with the XFS file system, so uh, it's a bit of an unknown territory for me. Uh, I've never ever seen that error before, but then I've never used anything but EXT 2, 3, or 4 to boot. Um, well, any uh, operating system I've installed uh, as far as LFS and Gen 2 is concerned. So it looks like that might be a problem. So um, as it's not causing a problem with the boot, I'm going to ignore it and hope that at a future Grub or XFS upgrade that the error message will disappear at that time. So what I'm going to do first of all is um, log in and I've got to finish off the end of the first chapter of the handbook that we were in so the last part is called finalizing so this is the last bit after we rebooted and what I'm going to attempt to do is to um, get the browser up well we haven't got links let me see if we've got link yeah I oh know we've got link okay so what we need to do first of all is um, install a text browser so I can actually browse the internet from the text um, console so I usually use links there's ones called links, spelt that way. Um, I prefer links as in the animal. So I'll install that first. So there will be quite a bit of compiling getting this going obviously because we'll be installing new packages and some of the packages are quite big so it could take several hours to complete the installation of, uh, well ultimately KDE um, but that's part and parcel of a uh, source based distribution. So I've got links installed so I'm going to run links and I want to go to let's put HTTPS in www dot gen two dot org and wiki and book okay so what have I spelt wrong there gen two dot org Okay, let's try from the main page. 
So you can see the highlighted bit is the yellow bit that's moving along the top of the screen at the moment. As I move to the down arrow, that's moving along. So I need to look for a link that indicates the handbook. Um, let's try to get started now. I'll do the page down. Yeah, there it is there down there in red, Gen 2 handbook. And there it is in yellow. So I need to make sure I'm on the AMD 64 one. So there it is there. And then I need to go to finalizing. So this is still in chapter one. As I said yesterday, there's four chapters. So the second one's working with Gen 2, which gives some more details about how to use the portage system. And the third chapter, a bit more detail, advanced features, and the network configuration is the last one, which is just off there. It is there. There's all that lot if you need to still configure the network. So I'll just be concentrating on finalizing for the moment. And there's not a lot on this page really, apart from basically adding a day to day user, as it says there, adding user for daily use. Um, as it says, using root is dangerous and should be avoided as much as possible. Therefore, it's strongly recommended to add one or more standard user accounts for day-to-day -day use. Um, and then it's uh, mentioned some groups that you might want this user to be part of. Now, at the moment, because we've got a very basic system, a lot of these groups may not exist because we haven't in installed any software that provides um, the functionality for these groups. So it's a bit pointless having the groups, really, I guess without that functionality. Um, so what we need to do is to, as it says there, use the program called UserAd with some options to specify what user we're adding, what shell it has, and what parts or what groups it, it can be part of. So what I'm gonna do is gonna press Alt F2 to get another virtual terminal up, log in again as root, and start typing that command in. In fact, I should be able to use GPM, which I installed yesterday, if I remember. Not that mouse, this one here. So in theory, I should be able to just copy that. Go back to the second virtual terminal, paste that in with a center click, and just modify this. So the last part is the name of the user. This part here, minus S bin bash, is the default shell. And then these are all the default groups, or, or sorry, the additional groups you want this user to be part of. The default group will be a group created especially with the same name as the user. So there'll be a group called kernel text, which kernel text will be part of. Let's go back and see what other groups there are that could be part of. So probably want to be part of most of these. Um, if not all, actually, um, probably not portage actually um, so I've got audio cd-rom and cron let's add those in audio cd-rom cron uh, floppy well if I add a floppy disk um, I'd add that in but this machine hasn't got a floppy disk but for an older machine that would be quite important or could be quite important then USB video and wheel. So USB video and wheel is already there. Wheel just allows super user access. And that looks like that's it. So if I press enter there, uh, oh, and the minus M creates a home directory. So this should be now a home directory uh, kernel text directory in the home directory and there it is so it's the default home directory now i need to create a password for that user uh, and that's done so i should be able to log in as that user So let's try it. I'm going to log out here and log in as kernel text. 
and there I am with a different color prompt showing me that I'm a normal user and I'm in my oops, home directory and let's try and become the root which I should be able to do because I've given myself access to the wheel group so I need to type in the root password here and yes I've become root so that's good So it says there about deleting the root password so that nobody can actually log in as root, which might be an idea um, if you're concerned about that sort of thing. Um, but apart from that, that's more or less it. It says to delete the stage three tar. I tend to leave that because it's a, a file with a date stamp in it. So it gives me an idea of when the Gen 2 installation took place, roughly, um, as it's got the date of the stage 3 archive so it'll be accurate to within a week of when it was installed and some more uh, links there with uh, links to documentation the next chapter as I say working with Gen 2 and as you can see down the bottom there's a bit there to do with desktop environments and window managers which is what we'll be moving on to as I say to install KDE Plasma. Uh, there are other desktop environments and window managers and so on um, but this, this is one I prefer. There's obviously um, GNOME is a big one, um, but uh, that, this is what I, I prefer. It's it's similar um, in the way that the traditional Windows interface has worked, and I guess most people have come from that background. I, I certainly did around the turn of Millennium, so it's most familiar. GNOME I've tried to use, and the, the latest version of GNOME I just find a bit baffling. I don't really get it. So I, I just prefer to stick with KDE. And as I say, anybody who's come from Windows environment, KDE is probably a more familiar environment. Okay, so I'm gonna come out of that. I'll switch the user to kernel text here as well. I think this is the primary login terminal. I'll come out of it there on the second terminal. And I'll run links from here. And I'm going to first of all install sudo because I think that'll be quite useful to um, have available as we're going to do a bit of installing and some configuration and so on. So um, what I'm going to do is jump to a page that gives some information about installing sudo. There's mostly a wiki page for important packages on Gen 2. If you just type Gen 2 in the name of the package you want some information about, generally there's a wiki page giving some extra details about how to install it and configure it. Um, otherwise, if there isn't, you generally come up against a web page that um, describes the actual package, the details of the package, which is not really helpful in terms of installation, but it can be helpful in terms of seeing what other versions are currently available in the repositories. So I want to go to https forward slash forward slash wiki dot gen two dot org forward slash wiki forward slash sudo. And if I just scroll down to the beginning, so there at the bottom of there it says the sudo command provides a simple and secure way to configure privilege escalation i.e. letting normal let users execute certain or even all commands as root or another user either with or without giving a password to allow some users to perform certain administrative steps on a system without granting them total root access using sudo is the best option using sudo allows control over who can do that so as it says this is a quick introduction um, but it's a good introduction if you're um, not sure about how to configure it and so on it gives some basic configuration um, getting it going so these are some of the use uh, flags that can be set or unset um, as you'll see as we go along uh, you'll get to know these a little bit better some are global and some are in per package um, and there is a um, Let's put this on a different terminal. Let's put this on terminal six because we'll probably come back to 
uses quite often. So I'm on virtual terminal six, I press the alt six, log in, and I'm going to do links. Um, let me find it on another terminal so I can go to it straight away. So although we saw in the previous video that there is um, an index file on the disk with the latest um, use flags, global use flags, I find that using the wiki page is probably a lot easier. So the website we want to go to is https colon forward slash forward slash www.gen2.org forward slash support ported for slash use dash flags okay I spelled something wrong there again I'll support okay so here's the index so each one of these in this bluish color is one of the flags with a quick description as to what that flag does. And generally these flags um, are the use flags that go in make.conf. So we looked at that yesterday. If I go back to, or oh, get another terminal open. And do become root. And then edit the etc portage make.conf. If you remember yesterday, we've got down here, the use flags here. So at the moment I've got mostly stuff I've turned off um, and one I've turned on by adding it. So these other ones that are turned off, they're probably implied or set by the profile that I've selected. Um, and I know that I don't want them, so I've explicitly turned them off. So the use flags here override what the profile has set. I've then also added an LTO so that anything built that has that flag LTO will be built with this link time optimization. And because these flags are global, whatever flags appear here will, app uh, will apply to every single package that I install. If I want to apply flags per package, and therefore I might not be in this list here in the global list, then that gets added to the portage .use, uh, sorry, package.use file which I'll be creating as soon as I find that I've got a reason to add to that file and it might be even that I've added a flag globally that works with all the packages that use it but there's one with a particular package and there may be a problem that that flag being switched on doesn't work or maybe I don't want it to be activated for that particular package and by using the package.use uh, file I can deactivate it individually so despite the fact it's generally a global flag um, it can be put in package.use to turn off on an individual package basis so if i go back to the um, page for installing sudo it doesn't actually specify whether these are global or not you just tend to get to know which ones are or suspect that they are for example pam will be a global use flag so if i jump to back here and scroll down there it is there, PAM, as you can see, it's a global um, flag and it will be switched on by default, probably for all profiles, I imagine. I, I imagine that's there by default um, globally, everywhere on every single profile. And it does say it's dangerous to arbitrarily flip and I have to admit, I've never had any reason to um, turn that off at all. Um, and then if we look at another one, uh, for example, secure path, I imagine that's not in the global list. So let's jump back and look for secure path. So yeah, see it's not there. There's only something called secure boot. So that will be a flag that's purely individual to this particular package, sudo. And that means that you wouldn't want to add this to the global um use flags in make.conf because there might be another package which uses the same flag name but might be interpreted slightly different and have a different effect so if it is an individual flag don't try and add it to the make.conf it's not not a good idea 
generally the flags that are provided by default will get you going um, but you'll probably find that a lot are disabled and you might want to turn on a lot of the flags to enable extra functionality or pull in other packages uh, it's just a case of trying things out and seeing what you want what you th think you might need enabling them and then recompiling to um, add in that functionality so we want to install um, sudo so let's just scroll down and see what it says so it gives us a command here to actually add it in so st standard command is basically the package name and the um, I think this is the catalog this part is called so it's like a is it the catalog I think it's called the catalog this first part is like a collection if you like and within that collection there'll be specific programs that come under that that banner that catalog if you like so there'll be several admin applications that will share this catalog or sorry category that's what it is it's category this category with sudo and generally it's a good idea to provide the category name because there are some packages that have got identical names but are different packages um, so generally it's a good idea if you do provide a package name and it's ambiguous you'll get a prompt saying you know I don't know which do you mean and then it will list the packages that match what you've provided but also with the um, categories that, that they are in so that you have to be a bit more explicit and provide the category um, as, as to which one you specifically want installed the ask as we've seen before will ask you if you want to really install it otherwise if you don't put that in it will just emerge it um, and you might want to review the flag settings before you go ahead and compile it it's always a good idea I find to add in let's get another terminal up with a prompt um, it's always a good idea I find to add in uh, I've done my password wrong there the verbose flag because that gives you a little bit more information so if I just put that command in there, oh, let's go to root first if I put that command in so it's come up with this information but you can get a little bit more information by adding the V flag or verbose and as you can see you've got a little bit more information there it tells you how big the package is um, what else is yeah help yeah that's what that so these ones here either there's nothing to download that they might just be virtual packages actually judging, judging by the category they're in um, yeah they are um, or they already exist on the hard disk in which case obviously there's no reason to download them otherwise it shows you the download size to give you an idea and then it gives you the cumulative download size so that can be a little bit more useful to have uh, by supplying the verbose option um, also as you can see with both options with and without the, ver the verbose you can see which flags are going to be turned on or which are turned on currently um, so if you decide there's something else you want to have turned on now's the time to add that use flag in the correct place either in the make.conf if it's a global flag or the package.use if it's an individual package flag I'm happy with that so I'm just going to press enter and let that install while that's installing I'm going to go back to the screen here and just see what I need to do yeah it says the configuration is managed by the sudo as far so we'll be going into that to modify um, the settings it says always use via sudo that does some checks um, and as it says it also makes sure that no two system administrators are editing the file at the same time which won't happen on this machine because it's only me using it um, it gives some information there about how to use it uh, but generally I think there's some hints in the actual file and then some more advanced stuff with LDAP for the rest of the page which we're not really interested in so 
let's go back to the screen where it's building. So it looks like it's just about done. Okay, so let's done just read the messages here. It says there's some extra packages it suggests installing. Um, so I might want to add them in, but it looks like they're for um, a GUI environment, which we haven't got at the moment. So it might pull in some other packages that would interfere with our work at the moment. Not not packages that won't won't be needed. They will be, but just might interfere with what we're doing. So we'll leave that for now. So I'm going to run vice sudo or vice sudo and somewhere down the bottom here yeah is some options here and what I'm going to do is remove this option here this remark here and what this will do it will allow anybody who's a member of the wheel group to become root or to run privileged commands without asking for a password. If you don't want that and you want it to ask for a password, um, use this one in here instead. Um, and you can do the same thing to have anybody that's member of the sudo groups. So that could be a bit more tighter, uh, a bit tighter. You could have the wheel group to perform several privileged functions, whereas the sudo, people with member of the sudo group can only use sudo to become root or to execute root functions so I'm going to change that to not use any passwords or not request any passwords go back to the screen I've got with uh, if I can find one right I haven't got one so I'll log in once more on another screen so it's a new logon so this logon should have this new functionality um, so if I do sudo su minus you can see I've become root straight away without it asking me for a password or my password as it would be. Um, if I'd not done the no password option on this screen here, if I'd selected that one instead and left this one remarked out, then that sudo su minus would have asked for my password. Um, but otherwise, if I wasn't part of the wheel group at all, I wouldn't have been able to run that sudo command at all. It wouldn't have allowed me. So that's got that functionality all working correctly so I'll come out of that and I'll come out of this one so let's try sudo su minus here oh it does work immediately okay so that's good so that's sudo done so what I'm going to do next is to start on the KDE plasma installation Um, and as I go along, I'll probably be adding other little tools and packages in, which are quite useful to have. Um, so let's go back here. I'll quit this and go into the KDE page, the wiki page for KDE. So there's a lot of information on here, so I've got to read this carefully. So it suggests about, again, changing the profile. So if I um, go to this and do eselect profile list. Well, there's loads of profiles there. Let's pipe it through less to get a page at a time. There's uh, loads here, but as you can see, some of these have got desktop profiles, and that's what was recommended, but I chose not to. So there's still a chance you could change the profile to desktop and you'll get a lot of um, packages pulled in with certain flags set for a default sane value. Um, and it will save a lot of uh, customization and, and um, configuration that we're going to do now. But I feel that just by having the... Um, like the lower level multi, no multi lib profile set that would have a little bit more control control over what gets installed. So that's why I'm going to remain that that would be in blue, I believe, if I hadn't piped it through less. But that is the default profile number twenty two uh, twenty nine. Otherwise, if you wanted to use a no multi lib, you'd have to find one. Is there one? 
Didn't look like there is actually. No, so maybe that's another reason why I don't select a desktop profile because I want a no multi-lib installation, but there is no desktop profile for mul no multi-lib the looks of it. So, um, for Plasma desktop environment, choose Desktop Plasma with OpenRC or Desktop Plasma system. So this is the profiles it's still talking about. Services will be brought in automatically depending on profile selection made earlier. And then it says, for deviating from defaults, it's recommended to install them in advance of KDE Plasma or KDE Gear via Emerge one shot. So the Plasma will take them into account. Follow the links for information on how to set up these services. Okay, so we need to install these items here before we can go any further. So the first thing we need to do is ins to install eLoginD, which is a standalone LoginD package, default for the desktop Plasma profile extracted from SystemD project for use with OpenRC or other init systems, or SystemD, the session tracker for part of SystemD. So users of SystemD do not need to take any other initiative here. So because I'm using OpenRC, I need to install eLoginD. So I'll go to that link. I'll follow that one. Press enter and see what it tells me to do here. So the first thing it tells me to do is to ensure there's some settings that are set in the kernel. So it's going to be a few times we're going to have to make modifications to the kernel. So let's go into the kernel sources here. Make menu config. Spell it correctly. And we're looking for under general setup control group support. General setup control group support. And we want to have, oh, right, I just want that to be selected, which it is, so that's okay. Uh, in fact, it looks like something else has pulled it in automatically because it's got the dashes next to it rather than the brackets. And then under file systems, we want. Uh, I notify support for user space. I notify support that probably is selected, I imagine. Yep, that's already forced on as well. So that's all right. There's no changes there to do. So we'll just quit that. Then we've got to check the use flags. So it suggests some use flags there. Um, I don't think there's anything that really needs to be set. Um, ACL might be useful. It might already be set. Um, yeah, I'm not sure about that. Um, one thing... There's a program called eQuery, which doesn't get installed by default, and that can be quite useful to look to see what packages have got, or what defaults have got, or what we've got installed or want to install. And if I can remember the name of the package, um, let me look on another screen to see what this might be called. Um, right. 
Okay, yes, it's part of um, a package called Gen2 or Gen Toolkit. So I'm going to merge that Gen Tool Kit minus AV. And this, as I say, provides us with a few extra tools uh, for looking to see what um, we can do with Portage. So eQuery, if I do that by itself, it gives you a quick list of what functions it's got. And I want to use the U, which is the use function. And I want to find out what e login D has got. And as you can see, as I suggested, it's already got ACL set anyway, so I don't really need to set that. Um, I suppose I could add it in. Um, it is a global parameter. Uh, if I can find my uses. Um, ACL, there it is there. Um, so arguably I could add it in so that I know that it is active. So I might just do that just to... You know, if I come here I can, and I'm in any doubt, I can see straight away that ACL is active. And I'll do the same for PAM as well. Oh yes, it's there, there actually with the defaults that I looked up. So I might actually just add these all in. So ACL, copy and paste these to save any typos. Uh, not sure what CT is. I'll add that in for now. GDPM, icon V, and as you notice, I put these in alphabetical order just so they're easier to locate. Okay, this is It's really the rest of these. I'm just copy and paste. So I'll save that. Uh, oh, what's happening there? No previous substitute. Oh, right. I'm right. Doing the wrong command. Um, so now if I rerun. Uh, no, I need to. Emerge, I think, don't I? Let's go back to the instructions. Right. There is global e login use flag, e login D use flag for enabling e login D support in other packages. It's also recommended to disable support for other session trackers. Okay, so they're recommending to add in e login D to let other packages know that e login D is going to or is installed and by. Uh, removing system D, we ensure that we don't have two system trackers installed. So that sounds like a good idea. So let's put both of these in to this use command here, use list. So e login D will go here. And we want to remove system D, or not remove it, make sure it never gets installed. So that should go there. So I'll save that. And then it says to emerge, ask change use deep world. And the reason why it's doing that rather than explicitly adding in e login D is because uh, e login D might be removed for another session tracker. And if we put it into world, it'll be effectively hard coded there um, unless we specifically know we want to keep e login D but if there is a replacement it's called something else then this method will hopefully automatically bring that in and the fact that we've also added in the e login e login D flag the use flag it should recognize that and bring e login D for us automatically and anything else it needs obviously so can I see? I can't even see you logging. Do yeah, there it is. There, so it has brought it in, but we're not hard coding it into the world. 
file, which is probably a good thing. And yes, there's two existing files or packages rather already installed that will make use of eLogging these. And now it's going to be installed. These packages will be recompiled to take advantage of that functionality that eLogging will provide to them. So let's get these compiling. Um, I can't imagine these will take too long, a few minutes maybe. I think they're going to be quite small packages. Right, so that's all installed. Um, it says eLogin D is currently not started from any run level. You may add it to the boot run level by doing this command. So let's do that. Oh, it says alternatively you can leave out eLogin D from any run level will then be started automatically when the first service calls it via dbus or the first user logs into the system okay let's see what the book says all right it does say e login d should be configured to start at boot time and when dbus is installed with the use login flag starting e login d on boot triggers the dbus system daemon to load automatically which kind of Sounds like the other way around from what's being mentioned here. So I think I'll add it in because I think I normally have added it. And let's start it as well. Okay. 
Okay, so that's started successfully. Um, so it says about DBus integration, so I won't do this. To have a login D session created when the start when using StarTex to start the X server, so we're not going to be using StarTex. We're going to be starting with a um, a desktop manager, a uh, window manager. Sorry. Sorry, display manager. I get these terms right; they're all very confusing. Um, so, display manager is something like Light DM or SDDM, where it gives you a graphical log on screen. Um, otherwise, if it was starting with Star Text, then obviously they'd have to do this. Um, So it's about suspend, hibernate, resume, and thaw. I'm not interested in that. Confirming full functionality. Um, let's see if this runs as a normal user. It said no sessions, probably because we haven't logged in under it, maybe, or haven't set that X in it. Oh yes, there it is because we haven't logged in under it. So that's returned something. So that's good. Obviously, if there'd been other users logged in through this, it would display them, I imagine. If you're using PAM, make sure there are no conflicting pending changes waiting to be written to ETC. When the changes took place. Let's have a look at this. Yeah, that looks okay. They're in a different order, but otherwise they're the same. And that's it. So that looks like that's all okay. So that's the e login D. Um, so I'll go back by pressing the left arrow and we'll now move down to here where we have to choose a device manager. And it says choose exactly one of you, Dev, EU, Dev, or System D. Well, obviously, again, System D is not what we need. Um, Dev enable support for the Dev Linux dynamic and persistent device naming and EU Dev fork of Dev for better capacity. With Compatibility with old kernels and various tool chains no longer maintained by Gen 2 and discouraged, so it's got to be UDEV. So let's go down to that and move into that one. Right, what is UDEV? Most users understand that dev sda one is just a fast way of referring to the first partition of the first disk that, that the kernel found. That's pretty easy, right? So it describes here how it's a dynamic system that generates these nodes based on the hardware that's in the system. The kernel goes around and interrogates things. Um, and yeah, we do need to make some changes to the kernel, at least check that the options have been set. So let's become the root again. Go into the Linux kernel, make menu config. And we need to check, first of all, general setup. Configure standard kernel features expert users. There it is there, so we need to set that and enable signal FD system call. Oh, let's go into it. So 
so yes that's already forced on then we need to go to enable the block layer and check that block layer SG support v4 is set block layer support v4 block layer SG support v4 block layer SG support okay it's worded slightly differently but that's the one then networking support networking support and networking options top one and we want to check that Unix domain sockets, that's already forced on. Then device drivers, generic options. Device drivers, generic driver options. And we want to make sure that path to U event helper, helper is empty, which it is. And maintain a dev temp FS file systems mount at dev is set. Well, that's already forced on as well. And then back up one, we want to make sure that the deprecated ATA, ATA, PEI, MFM, RLL support is unchecked, which I believe it is. In fact, it looks like it's not even there. Yeah, it looks like that might be removed or it's been hidden because we're on a 64-bit kernel possibly. So that's under device, directly under device drivers, isn't it? Yes, so it looks like that's not there, so that's good. Then file systems want our notify support for user space, which I think is already set. Yeah, that's forced on. And pseudo file systems we need proc and sysfs and again I think they're already set. Uh, pseudo file systems. So proc set and sysfs is also set, so that's good. Um, so I'll exit that. That's now saved. Um, I'll not build that until we need to build it, I think, just to save a bit of time. The main thing is the config has been set, so any program that checks the settings should see that those settings are set, even though they might not be enabled in the kernel. Hopefully it won't cause any problems. Um, Portage knows the UDEV use flag for enabling support for UDEV and other packages. Adding this to the use flag value to the file make.conf will put it in automatically. So we need to add in UDEV. So I'll add it there. Save that. Um, And there's some other use flags there, which may or may not be of use. That's probably just best to accept the defaults. And then we, again, do an update to bring that in. Because we've set a flag for it, it should be pulled in. Um, okay, looks like it's not being pulled in, but it may already be installed, that's a possibility. Uh, but certainly Util Linux makes use of it, so I would say it probably, probably already exists. Let's do an e-query again. And this time we use a Y, which will tell us what package versions are available. And do UDEV. So yes, you can see it, there's only one version available to be installed, and it is in fact already installed as suspected, is what this little I is here for in the brackets. Um, and that makes sense because if it wasn't installed, it would have to be pulled in to allow Util Linux to make use of it via this use flag. So let's do the update to update Util Linux.
Okay, there's some messages there, nothing important. Um, and as usual, as it says, after a world update, you should really run depth clean. Generally, installing new packages doesn't really warrant a depth clean, but very occasionally it might release another package because the package you've installed has maybe outdated something else or made something else um, obsolete. Um, okay, so nano is not required anymore because I've set Vim as my editor and it's not in the world file so it's, it's wanting to pull it out but it's warning me that it's part of the system profile. Um, I tend not to use it, It's I find it a little bit basic so I find Vim a little bit more powerful, a bit more useful so I'm going to remove that at the moment and it doesn't look like it's going to release any other packages, it's just this one package so that's gone. So let's go back. So this needs to be added to the startup scripts to the system initialization. So let's put that in and oh, it's already installed in the sysinit run level, which makes sense. I guess it's already installed. It probably also means that it's running as well. So if we do etc init dot d um, you dev status yeah you see it started already so we don't need to start it it is already running and there's some information there about advanced configuration if you need to deal with that um, there's uh, stuff there about predictable network interfaces if you want to change how that behaves. Um, something there about keyboards. The hardware database must be updated also suitable for OpenRC. So this might be something that possibly needs to be added to the cron tab for a regular update. Oops, I've just pasted that in there. Let's run it anywhere. Yeah, that's done an update. There's not, nothing to update there by the looks of it. Um, what have I done here? But generally, there's not anything else that needs to be done there. Unless, like I say, you're getting some problems with some devices, then you might need to read that page in a bit more detail. So that's you dev done let's go back and we've still got dbus polkit and u disks to install under here under miscellaneous so let's go to dbus next and it looks like this may have been pulled in by elogin d anyway but we'll go through it anyway to check see if there's anything else that needs to be done So again, it says to add dbus to the use flags. So let's go to that and find it. There it is there. So it doesn't exist at the moment. Save that. And there's some other um, use flags there that probably nothing to worry about. But once again, we just do an update to pull in any. Oops, I keep on doing that, pasting it in the wrong window. Um, by updating the use flags, we just tell the system to update the system based on the flags. And as you can see, it's pulling in anything else it thinks it needs and updating any pa existing packages that will make use of that new use flag.
Okay, so that's done. Let's see what else we need to do. So there's a D-Bus service. And it says to start it with that command. Find a prompt, there it is there on three. So it's already running actually. So it does also mean that, yeah, we don't need to add it at all. It's on the default run level. If we do RC update on its own. Uh, right, it's actually gone off the screen. So let's do less. You can see. Uh, no, it's not there. Oh, right. Yes, I think it got started automatically, didn't it? It said with e login D. So let's add it then. It will tell us if it is really there, but it looks like it isn't. Yep, it's been added. So it will get started automatically now. It's reboot. Um, a tip there, it says even without adding DBus to the default run level, it will often get started by DBus dependent services. And as I say, that's why it's running now, as it says there, why it mysteriously gets started, even though it has not been formally added to a system run level. Um, the session bus, if using a desktop environment such as KDE or, or GNOME, a session bus should be created automatically. More generally, however, a session bus might not get started automatically. In particular, this is the case when using StarTex, X in it RC. So this is talking as if the GUI is already running, so we can't do this. And again, it's talking about XINIT RC, so there's something we're not going to do because we're not going to start it from StarTex. Um, and it looks like there's not much else to do there. There's some troubleshooting information, but apart from that, that looks like DBus. So let's go back to this page and move on to Polkit. So So Polkit, formerly Policy Kit, is an authorization API. Privileged programs in the following called Demons with Polkit support offload decision as to whether a program is allowed to use some function of the daemon. The daemon keeps an incoming request on hold. Ask Polkit if the program is authorized and then allows or denies a request based on Polkit's return. The requesting program is not aware of Polkit and so needs no Polkit support itself. The communication is handled over DBus. Demons come with Polkit action files which offer some function and define who is authorized. This can be any user either with the active or inactive user. Also, they can specify that the user needs to be authenticated by entering a password as himself or as admin. These actions do not grant root permission to, to an entire process, but rather allows a final level of control of centralized system policy. Um, okay. So Polkit uses DBus to so set that up first. We've done that. Also make sure you have set config equal futex equals y. Okay, so we need to go back and check the kernel. So make menu config again. And we've got to check, check futex. So futx. And it is set as you can see there. So we don't need to modify anything there. Use flags. Uh, so it doesn't look like there's anything there we might want to turn on immediately. Um, GTK may be something that gets turned on later, but at the moment it's probably not necessary. So again, it looks like all we need to do is, oh, we need to add in policy kit to the use flags. Uh, which 
choose that one there. So policy kit. And now we can run the update command again to pull in anything that's required with that and it doesn't look like it's done anything so um, again it could be the policy kit already exists um, what's it called poll kit was it yes yeah it's already installed so we haven't got anything that uses poll kit directly in terms of uh, use flags but it's there already because the profile deems it necessary to exist Or, or in fact, we could have installed something like Elong in D that's pulled it in or previously. That's a, a possibility. Uh, it's got some information about configuration and testing it and so on, but it should be fine just to have that as it is. Next thing we need to do is U disks. So we'll go into that. And it says U-Disks uses Dbus and Poll Kits to set them up first. We've done that. And once again, we've got some kernel settings to check. So memory management options. Which is that one there. And support for paging of an anonymous memory swap. That's already set. Device drivers, we want USB support and support for host side USB. USB support, support for host side USB, yep, that's already set. File systems, native language support. And we need NLS UTF-8, which is that last option there. So that's set. Then sudo file systems, uh, which was there. And we want tempfs virtual memory file system support. Yeah, which is already forced on, and tempfs POSIX access control lists, which is already set to. And in order for UDIS to work with the LVM use flag, UDIS will require the following LVM kernel parameters. Now, I think it depends on what packages you install, but some packages do require LVM. So it might be an idea to turn this on. I think I'll turn this all off, um, actually. Multiple driver support. Yeah, I've got it turned off at the moment. So I'm going to leave that off at the moment until I know that I need it. There's no point in turning something on and find, well, that I never use it. Uh, so I'll leave it off. And as I say, when I, when I find that I do need it, if I do, then it can be turned on. So that's that set up. Um, not everything needs to be enabled. Some of the options are only needed for LVM2 snapshots and thin snapshots. And there's a wiki page detailing it as well. So once again, there's some more flags there that might want to be set possibly and others you recognize have already been set. And Again, we just add U disks to the uh, use flag list. And that will mean that when we run the update, any appropriate packages will be pulled in automatically again. And again, there's nothing there to uh, pull in, so 
it probably means that your disks already is installed for whatever reason. Um, no, it isn't actually. U disks. U disks. I've saved it. Save it again. Okay, so it seems that nothing actually requires it at the moment. So it's not being pulled in. So the first time that it is required by something, uh, it will be pulled in and it will always be pre-configured in the kernel. Um, it says make sure each user is in the plug dev group. Here's an example user Larry is used. Okay, so we probably haven't got that as um, it hasn't been installed, I guess. So let's try it. So let's add plug dev to one of the groups that kernel text can be part of. That doesn't exist. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to merge you disks but not add it to the world set so in addition to doing av i'm going to do something called one shot which will emerge it but it won't make it part of the system permanently so if i now did or if i did a subsequent depth clean it would try and remove it because it's not part of the system um, and it would only be prevented from being removed by adding it to the world set or if something else needs to use it. Uh, one shot can also be replaced by minus one as a shortcut. Right, is it one word, is it? Yeah, it is. New disks. So you can see now that's pulling in a, a load of stuff. Um, so I guess I can pull that in let that stuff build now and then I'll be able to add the user to the plug def. Um, I can't remember what plug def uses. I think it might be for adding things like USB sticks. Um, like external devices, that sort of thing as far as I can remember. So it's going to take a few minutes to install these 24 packages or so. So we'll come back when it's done.
Okay, so that's all finished. Um, now, one problem is we've got a terminal which can't scroll back on to see all the messages, which could be a bit of a problem. Um, so we'll have to try and install as few packages at a time as possible. Um, so, for example, there's one there about some fonts that have been installed right at the top, and it says to use eselect font config to enable them to disable them. So I'll have a look at that in a minute. There's something there, LVM has been installed, um, and it says please enable use equals LVM if you need the LVM daemon. So it looks like LVM has been installed, but um, I don't really need it. So I'm not going to change the kernel settings unless there's something that actually says that I do need to uh, deal with it. There's also this config DM crypt that needs to set in the kernel and it's not set at the moment. So I'm going to do that straight away. And then we've also got uh, some news items to read as well. So let's deal with the kernel first of all. Make menu config and it's DM crypt. We need to set DM underscore crypt. And we'll jump to that one. Okay, so it's just the multiple drivers by the looks of it. Oh, that's deprecated, so I'll remove that. So that should be sufficient to keep that happy. Save that. Uh, Eselect font config was the next thing I need to look at. And I can list the fonts that are installed on the system. So I don't know what just got installed, but it will be something there that um, may want to turn off, on or off. And again, with all the eselect commands are just a case of doing well in this case it's enable or disable rather than set a set is just one of many commands but an enable is uh, setting more than one command so for example if i wanted to enable uh, let's see one that might want to set can't see anything there actually let's do another list uh, yeah, I'm not sure what got installed there actually. Okay, so for example, say I want to do uh, 10 unhinted.conf, it's just a case of enabling, enable, and the number next to that, which is 15. So now if I do a list, you can see 15's got a star next to it, so that's been made available to the system. And likewise, if I want to get rid of it, well, it's just disable. And it's gone back again to not being enabled. Next I've got the news items to look at. So there's one about LVM. Read 11. So stuff about LVM there, which I don't really understand because I don't use it. But if, if you're a person that uses it or understands it, then obviously you'll be able to make more sense of that. Uh, so let's have another go at doing this command here. Paste it in. Kernel text is user. I want to modify. Okay, so it still hasn't added it. So I'm, I'm not sure what the book is going on about there. Um, if we've added U disk and it hasn't provided that um, root uh, that uh, group, um, right? So that's U dev done. So let's go back and scroll on to the next page. Uh, 